We have Zach Ferris with us today. And what we are going to be talking about is how you can create quantum leap improvements in your business through the smart use of technology. And the reason why I say the smart use of technology is because in many cases, businesses will implement technology and then they'll implement another technology and then another technology, or there will be something that's horribly complicated. And, you know, technology has kind of become table stakes for a lot of business, but you have to be really smart about the way you do it. Otherwise, you can bog down your business. So, but anyway, I don't want to talk for too long. Zach, please introduce yourself. Hey, everyone. And my name is Zach Ferris. I'm the CEO of Fortrader Insurance. And essentially, you know, I'm a seasoned insurance professional with a plethora of experience on the captive side of insurance, where I started with farmer's insurance, and then now I'm on the independent side. Yeah, I was going to say uh, the ADHD part of my brain wanted to immediately said, but do you know what a plethora is? So that <laughs> is a reference to the movie, the classic 80s movie with Steve Martin, Martin Short, and Chevy Chase, The Three Amigos. But Anyway, <laughs> tangent over, <laughs> tangent over. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> Go ahead. You said the word plethora. And every time I hear that word, a, a bell goes off in my head. Hey, no worries, man. Yeah. My, sorry, my vocabulary is a little expanded there. Uh, <laughs> man. I go off on little tangents sometimes as well. So yeah, I mean, essentially, you know, I've taken both agencies that I've owned mm -hmm. to from zero dollars at scratch to multi-million dollar exits. Uh, the first one uh -huh. with farmers at 2.8 million dollars exit and then 6.1 when I was a franchise owner with Goosehead. Wow, that's outstanding. Okay, well, so tell me a little bit about some of the work you're doing at Axie PR. Mm -hmm. How did you come about this specific niche? And tell me a little bit about how you've been able to implement technology to really improve the output of the clients. Yeah, so I mean, well, Axie PR is a company owned by Jason Mudd. I got with them to help me do PR for our agency. Mm -hmm. And you know, essentially, they're just helping us get get our name out there. So Jason had a background on personally working with Brightway Insurance, who's a competitor in the space, and helped them really get them out their brand out in the in the space, mm -hmm. so to speak. And so that's what they're helping me do right now. You know, as far as the Axia is concerned, that's their goal is to have brand awareness to get me in front of as many people as possible to let them know that you know, Fortreator Insurance is here and we're not going anywhere. Gotcha. And we're, we're only growing and scaling from there. Gotcha. All right. So in your case, you have technology from two pieces, right? We have both going out, being able to book out into podcasts, which of course is what we're doing right now. And then also on the insurance side is basically being able to take what used to be a multi-hour process and condensing it down into just a couple of minutes. Exactly. So walk me through how you were able to do that without creating a technology quagmire, because that's a comparatively infrequent event. Yeah. So, I mean, essentially, you know, the way the insurance industry is set up right now, as far as independent agents are concerned, is you have all of these different softwares and technologies out there for people to use, right? So yeah. we say there's other competitors out there. They'll have sponsored events where you have all the vendors come out show their technologies and, and et cetera. And I was like, what could we do? What's a problem that we could solve in the in insurance industry that has not been solved yet? Mm -hmm. And how can we do it from a different angle? And so what we have now in, in the industry that we're seeing is you see all these direct-to-consumer insurance carriers, right? So you have people like Geico who've been around, been very successful. They have a way where Consumers can get on their website, get on their cell phone, get on their app, and just get a quote in minutes. Uh huh. Right. So, yeah. And you have all these different softwares here coming out. There's the Jerry app, there's Zebra. Their technology is geared towards consumers, whereas a consumer can go onto their websites, put in all their information, and they're going to get a quote from all the different carriers Travelers, Safeco, Elephant foremost, Bristol West, you name it, mm -hmm. they're going to be able to get those quotes. So what we have done is we have taken a different approach and let's say, hey, how can we help the insurance agent? So we've developed a patented software. It's actually called Quote to Bind. Uh -huh. And uh, this you're the first person I'm sharing this with because we're about to roll it out in Q1, where we have allowed agents to basically utilize a few technologies that we have partnered with already and we share APIs with them 
and it allows them to bypass the carrier's website from whenever they do all the quotes to their carriers, it's going to bring all of those, essentially be able to bypass having to bridge over into the progressive website, for example, to mm-hmm. finish binding the policy. They'll be able to do that within our software. Oh, interesting. Well, and, you know, because I remember um, I had a brief stint in the actually life insurance industry on my way through, uh, you know, up to adulting. That was my first gig out of college was I you know, sold uh, loaded mutual funds and life insurance policies through mass mutual. Okay. And, you know, the, the dig that we'd always make on brokers would be that, you know, people would say, oh, well, yeah, I work with brokers so I can get the best deal. I'm like, what I just heard was I work with a broker who shows me the products that pay the highest commission. <laughs> I don't know if that's what you're enabling or not, but that's the behavior that nice. I've seen. That's essentially what these carriers do, right? And that's what a lot of these agents who are looking to get on the independent side look to do. They're like, hey, Who has the most carriers? Who has the highest commission splits? Yeah, exactly. Okay, well, let's see. I'd like to dig into the process a little bit of how did you get to the point where you were able to put this technology stack together so that it works, I guess you'd say, without too much complexity, just because at least Mm -hmm. my observation is that my life is horribly complex. Mm -hmm. And granted, Mm -hmm. a lot of that is my own fault. But I think a lot of people (laughs) are having these exact same feelings that everything is just getting horribly complicated. And Mm -hmm. figuring out how to uncomplicate our lives is getting to be an increasingly important topic of conversation. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, absolutely. So what we did, first of all, I mean, our CTO is um, Robert Bobby Davidoff. He has extensive experience in computer science, Mm -hmm. computer programming. He actually mines Bitcoin all over the world right now for country governments all across the globe. I think he's actually in Indonesia right now. Okay. All right different topic because you know at the time of this recording the ftx bankruptcy and you know disappearance of key executives mm-hmm. with hundreds of millions of dollars of client funds yeah. is hot in the news so i'm going to be interested to see where everything goes with crypto and again i don't want to make this about crypto but it's i have <laughs> right? never gotten it because there is a and sorry i'm just going to go on a little bit of a tangent here because <laughs> no problem um, because you have both bitcoin and blockchain are based on a, you know, or the blockchain for both Bitcoin and Ethereum are based on proof of work, which basically means that you have, when people are mining, you have multiple people who are essentially doing the same validations and only one gets selected. So it's a winner take all. And Mm -hmm. so you have a whole bunch of work that is wasted. And I'm like, okay, how does that not result in a tremendous amount of overhead at some point? Yeah. Hey, I mean, that's something I would love to know. I have no clue about that space. Yeah. I've never gotten a clear answer. (laughs) And so that just makes me think that the viability ends up being dependent on exponentially increasing prices in order Mm -hmm. to keep that competition up for miners. And so what's going to happen if the price stays below 20,000 for a while? I don't know. Don't know. (laughs) Yeah. But but anyway, okay. Tangent over. (laughs) (laughs) No, you're good. Yeah, You're good. I mean, hey, I've wondered about all that stuff myself and I'm like, hey, you know, Bobby, you do your thing, man. (laughs) Yeah. But anyways, you know, so he's got extensive experience doing that. And he's also worked for the NSA as a contractor and a bunch of different things at a higher government level. So, you know, we have as far as programmers and and what we're doing, he knows exactly what we're doing. Our tech stack, he developed that Mm -hmm. essentially, you know, essentially what you got to ask yourself as an organization is, you know, are you going to build it yourself? Are you going to use somebody else's that has already been built? you know, or are you just going to not do it, right? So what we did is a little bit of both. We've taken a couple of softwares that are already out there and we've utilized their APIs and built ours with a custom feel to it. Essentially, there's nothing of my knowledge out in the industry Mm -hmm. that has been built like this before. And the reason I do know that is because in talking with all these insurance carriers, you know, a lot of the bigger carriers are having to invest in their technology side a little more to give us access to those APIs. Yeah. Which is more complicated than it sounds because a lot of these insurance carriers are 100 plus year old companies. And so mm-hmm. I happen to know that there is one that I won't mention, but there is one insurance carrier that I've done some work with that has a large digital transformation effort going because there were certain policies that they were only set up to receive via fax. Fax. Wow. (laughs) Wow. 
facts <laughs> f-a-x <laughs> like not facts like like things that are true like facsimile as in yeah <laughs> as in, like ancient as, yeah, yeah exactly and, and of course you know like everybody's like how in the world can this be the case it's like well you know and it's like that's how the policies were set up and you know in order to digitize it they basically have to completely redo their underwriting process <laughs> And in a lot of these larger, older companies, mm. that kind of thing takes a while. Absolutely. So, because yeah, like what you're talking about, it seems like, mm -hmm. okay, well, how could that be so hard? It's like, well, making an API isn't that hard. It's either pivoting around your organization so that you can get to the point where you can use an API or mm -hmm. figuring out how to get an API in that will somehow go around all of those internal dynamics to where you can transact business. That's what makes it hard. Exactly. Exactly. And see, and that's the issue that we have when we're dealing with some of the larger carriers. Yeah. You know, and there's a strategic reason that we partner with all the insure tech companies first uh -huh. doing this because they already have the technology that's possible and they're a lot easier to work with as far as integrating. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, and okay, so I'm going to take us in a little bit of a tangent direction. Okay. You, I mean, because, you know, insurance is probably one of the biggest kind of incumbent advantage industries you're going to have because, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of these incumbent companies, they're enormous. They've been around forever. They're usually frightfully inefficient in a lot of the processes, yet have tremendous staying power. And so, you know, because in a lot of other industries, you know, you know new entrants, particularly in technology, new entrants will disrupt the, the industry incumbents. You know, this is Clayton Christensen's innovator's dilemma. And of course, the thesis of the book was basically that innovation has to come from outside the leaders versus inside because mm -hmm. internal dynamics, usually you can't successfully foster innovation once you have a cash cow business. But insurance has kind of been insulated from that. Do you think that's going to continue? Or do you think that there's a day of reckoning coming for the insurance industry? I mean, that's a, I mean, that's a tough question. I think a little bit of both. Yeah. It kind of, you know, related is like, okay, you know, at some point is fintech, you know, can fintech figure out a way to displace mm -hmm. like Goldman Sachs, Chase, Wells Fargo, mm -hmm. those types of people? Because, you know, banking is the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. You have kind of a, a really small group of incumbent mega banks that are essentially mm -hmm. impervious to market disruption. Yeah. I mean, it's a, you know, it's a fair question, fair assessment. I see fintech is going to take a large, mm -hmm. larger percentage of the market share eventually, especially in the next 10 years. Yeah. Uh, I definitely see that coming. And then as far as like, you know, insurance, I mean, direct to consumer has already been around for a while, yeah. right? But they still only have six to 8% of the market share. And so even all these insure tech carriers who are coming out on the market, they realize that even when they started from the, the get go, that they're not going to get their product to the market fast enough unless they have independent agents yeah. distributing that for them. Yeah. Well, and I was just kind of thinking that's like the glass half full test is you say, okay, direct to consumer is six to 8% of the market. If you're an optimist, you say, look how much room there is to grow. If you're a pessimist, you say, okay, look how mm -hmm. big of a hill you're trying to go up here. Yeah. I mean, it, and it's, you know, that's kind of the same similar situation we're doing with our technology, right? This is, you know, it's been in the media uh, recently and they're calling it an industry disruptor. And it potentially it's going to be right. And it's the challenge that we're seeing is we're having to get all these big insurance carriers saying, Hey, you need to update your technology department because this is limiting how much business you can write because yeah. this technology is literally going to reduce the amount of time it takes for an agent to write a policy. Therefore, it can make you more money. Right. If it's taking your agents to quote and buying a policy in a faster amount of time. So it's really just about putting that value and benefit, you know, feature benefit analysis together yeah. and telling the carrier something that they've already known, which was to update their technology. And they just need to bite the bullet and do it. Yeah. That makes sense. Well, and because, yeah. So, like, one of the things that tells me is that I think that I would say that either the tech, you know, kind of the insure tech people are going to start making big leaps and bounds in terms, you know, are going to start making big gains, or a lot of the incumbent insurers or incumbent financial companies, because I'm thinking of this in just broad finance, mm -hmm. 
are going to have to figure out how to pivot a lot faster. I mean, because like, you know, the mm-hmm. fintechs, the startups, the, the tech companies, you know, they're all, mm-hmm. they're all coming. And I, I kind of see it as a race right now. I don't know how it's going to turn mm-hmm. out, but at least sort of, you know, what I've been seeing from my perspective and what it sounds like you're saying mm-hmm. is that essentially that all these technology-based insurers, they're trying to push direct to consumer. And now if they, once they get access to agents, if they're able to push past some of the major insurers, if they're able to move faster, innovate faster, as we were saying, which was the original topic of this conversation is creating right. a quantum leap improvements you know, mm-hmm. through the use of technology. I think then mm-hmm. this is actually, at least in my view, an example of how competition is supposed to work, which is that you have a lot of these established corporations that are basically being pushed to move faster because you have new entrants that are jumping out in front of them. And a lot of them are really concerned that they're going to start losing share of market, which they probably should be concerned. Right. For sure. And kind of to go on top of that, I like to say that I'm like, as far as the insurance industry is concerned, I like to see what trends are going on yep. and what's kind of going transformation wise. And if you look at insurance as a whole from a risk perspective, right? I mean, there was $154 billion in claims in Florida from that hurricane that just hit, right? Yeah. If you look at it from an overview, I feel like there's a reason there's more insure techs coming out Mm -hmm. of the woodworks on a daily basis. It's because for one, there's more risk and more claims that are happening. And we need more carriers to come into the game to share on this risk. Yeah, a lot. A lot of these investors, when you have one hundred fifty-four billion dollars in claims, think about your investors. What a nightmare that is as far as profitability. How much money they're losing by having to pay all of that out. So it just makes sense to make that quantum leap with this technology, get other carriers in the marketplace to share in this risk. And yeah, yeah you, you might have to lose some market share in order to do that. But I do see a time too, where if they don't invest in their technology, they're going to either A, be forced to buy the insure tech, right? Uh huh. Or they're going to get left behind. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. Well, and I mean, just from a me amateur economist perspective, <laughs> I actually, I like the idea of deconsolidating some of these, like the insurance and financial sectors, just because... I think anytime that you have a black swan event, you know, like say, you know, if there's a major earthquake or more hurricanes or something Mm -hmm. that results in a whole bunch of claims, or if there's a financial market cataclysm, which we're actually kind of close to right now, because with inflation expanding bond yields, now all of a sudden, a whole bunch of financial brokerage houses are upside down and, you know, people are going nuts and people are saying, oh my God, there's nothing like this has ever happened before. And it's like, well, okay, but. This, there's these laws of supply, demand, and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. What you're really saying is you were making easy money and it made sense to just ignore reality. <laughs> <Yeah>. anyway, exactly. <laughs> but anyway, that's neither here nor there. But anyway, I think that a little bit of deconsolidation would actually be really healthy because, again, you want to make sure that you are spreading out that risk so that you mm-hmm. can hopefully avoid a contagion effect. And a contagion effect is where you have a significant failure at one firm that, uh, you know, because in a lot of cases, especially in anything financial, usually the different financial companies will hold a lot of the other financial companies debt. Mm-hmm. And so like, for example, let's just say Wells Fargo, I'm not going to pick on Wells Fargo, but we'll, I'll just use it as an example. Let's say that Wells right. Fargo goes into default and they say, okay, well, we're not going to be able to pay back our bonds. Now, all of a sudden, there's a whole bunch of assets across pension funds, <laughs> you know, across all these <laughs> other financial institutions that have to be written down or written off. And if that pushes one of them into default, now you can have a cascading effect where you can have multiple defaults. And this is usually where the federal government has to come in with like a $4 trillion bailout package or something like that. And <laughs> the next week you're going to say, you'll see the Goldman Sachs, you know, still pays out bonuses. And or at least that's how it went in 2009. But, you know, this is the playbook. And I think right. that, you know, if we're going to avoid having the exact same things that have happened before happen mm-hmm. again, then the structure needs to change. Absolutely. Like, what do they say? The definition of insanity is doing the same, same thing, thing over and over. A different result. Exactly. I agree, man. Like four trillion dollar bailouts, you yeah. know, like what's that done? Yeah, <laughs> we've gotten a lot of inflation. We've gotten and a lot of inflation to- from that. 
Not well, to go on a tangent either, but what about the money to Ukraine that supposedly we have spent? What? We're sending money to Ukraine? <laughs> what? Is that new? So yes, for anybody who did not pick up on the sarcasm, at the time of this recording, the Russia-Ukraine war has been going on for about, I don't know what, around eight months. And the US has been, we've been funneling what, about, but I don't know, like 10, 20 billion a month, more <laughs> yeah, than that. I'm- ungodly amount of money yeah yeah just it might be more than that yeah but yeah we've been sending just tremendous amounts of money i think it's been like over uh, yeah i don't know the exact number but huge amounts of money in military aid to ukraine so yes we are not Mm -hmm. involved but we're basically funding it at or above the level that we would if we were fighting it ourselves (laughs) the only difference is we don't have troops there it's this weird Uh, way to be at war without being at war (laughs) exactly Uh, So, all right. Well, anyway, Zach, it's been a lot of fun. Give us one or two last thoughts and then let everybody Mm -hmm. know where they can find you online. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'd say if you're an independent agent out there, come check us out at Fortuator Insurance. We have a lot of unique value proposition to offer you and our software is going to be game changer for you and your agency. You can find me on Instagram, Zach.Ferris. Okay. Or LinkedIn, Facebook. I'm on all the social medias except for TikTok. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Well, yeah, you're going to need to start putting some dance, some caption dancing videos together then. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, although one of the things I've found, because, you know, like all uh, guilty confession, somebody said, hey, you should check out TikTok. And so then I just started scrolling and scrolling and scrolling mm-hmm. after a while time's gone by. There's a lot of people where basically what they'll do is they'll just recycle the same video footage and they'll just change the captions. And I'm like, oh, okay, yeah. there's a method to this madness here. There is. I'm going to check it out. Yeah. If you're looking at it on your phone, mm-hmm. if something comes across that you don't want to see more of in your feed, just do the long press and then select not interested. Because, well, I guess, unfortunately, you have a number of people who use TikTok to try to promote their OnlyFans page too. And it's like, all right, we got to stay, we got to get, get, get those off. I know. What's up with that? I need to start selling my feet pics. Yeah, yeah right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> And I think, you know, you could do the multi-account strategy, maybe. (laughs) Using technology. Yeah, using technology. All right, Zach, (laughs) I've had a great time talking with you. All right, you too, Doug. All right, catch you later. All right. Hey, thanks for watching till the end of the video. So my channel depends on the support of people like you. So there's a couple of things you could do that would really, really help. Number one, I need you to subscribe. So if you're not already a subscriber, please hit the subscribe button and turn notifications on. That way you'll know every time I publish new content. Number two, comment. I want you to share your thoughts. I want to know what you did and didn't like. What should I make next? If you really, really like this video, you could leave a super thanks in the comment and that will help me to create more great videos for you. And then number three, share this with your friends. Go on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, wherever you hang out socially and post this video, then let people know what you liked about it and then make sure to tag me. I really appreciate it and I hope you have a great day.